Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you all for coming. I know this, this time of the day is uh, in Latin America, it would, well, it's changing. <laughs> but uh, it used to be that uh, one and two, it would be siesta time. Mm. And I had an uncle who took that really serious in <laughs> uh, that he even put PJs on uh, between after lunch. So you have to be serious about it when, you know, you're not just going to lay on the couch for a little bit, but you're actually going to put on PJs um, to take a nap. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so a little bit about the the background. You mentioned, Doug, that, that uh, this is on something that I'm uh, on possi possibly publishing or in his mind. It's more on the in his mind uh, category. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, and this will be the first time that I uh, sort of put it out in public like this. So uh, have a go at me. Uh, I think that's the way that, that you learn. Um, and uh, the what motivated the talk, um, well, what motivated the talk was that my dean told me to ask me to do it. But... <laughs> uh, what uh, the reason I chose this topic um, came from uh, teaching my New Testament theology uh, class. Uh, we do normally the Gospels and Acts uh, have an exam, and then we do the Pauline letters. And um, I realized that uh, the students needed a little bit of a prolegomena to reading Paul. Uh, especially since the first letter in the canon, as we have it, is, is Romans. And there is just so much there that I thought, uh, if we're going to understand Romans, or try to understand Romans, and the rest of the Pauline corpus, uh, I need to, pr to try to provide a framework. And then, of course, let the framework be questioned as we go on, and then let the framework question and Sort of back and forth like that, uh, and so that's uh, that's where this uh, idea, this question, came to mind, uh, and uh, I finally tried to conceptualize it by by going with the title of uh, "Why Would Saul of Tarsus Become a Christian?" So uh, again, this is very much a work in progress. Uh, I'll read the beginning, uh, and then I'll just uh, sort of talk. Uh, after the introduction. Why would Saul of Tarsus become a Christian? The initial title for this talk was Why Did Saul Become a Christian? By the way, I realize that when I use the word Christian to speak about Saul at, at, at this point, it's an anachronism. Uh, Christians were not so called until much later at Antioch. Okay, uh, But I'm not going to say why did so become a believer in Jesus. So let's just leave it as Christian. So the initial title of the talk was, Why Did Saul Become a Christian? The more reflection I gave to the title and what I wanted to communicate, I decided that a better title is the one in front of you, Why Would Saul of Tarsus Become a Christian? In this case, the change to the subjunctive would instead of did makes, at the risk of overstatement, all the difference. Because to frame the question as why did Saul of Tarsus become a Christian may imply that, given Saul's knowledge of Judaism and his knowledge of the Christian faith, by the way, I'm assuming that he heard enough, uh, angry though he was, but that he heard enough of the Christian faith uh, from, from the Christians that he persecuted, certainly Stephen, that, that he knew something of, of the Christian faith. So. Going with why did Saul of Tarsus become a Christian may imply that given his knowledge of Judaism and his knowledge of the Christian faith, he would surely move on from Judaism. However, by the seemingly insignificant change to the word would, a sense of contingency is introduced. Why would Saul of Tarsus become a Christian? 
we can translate it into the more colloquial English. Why in the world would Saul become a Christian? By putting it like that, I'm getting more at what I want to say. The other option, the one on my initial title, why did Saul become a Christian, may have given the impression that to convert from Judaism to Christianity will have been for Saul a logical step, a rational move. Who in their right mind would continue in Judaism after hearing the wonderful news of the gospel? In this scenario, Judaism is viewed as a clear negative and Christianity as a clear positive. Judaism equals works, shortcomings, hopeless efforts, failures, an unclean conscience, and so on, while Christianity equals grace, forgiveness, freedom, a purified conscience, and so on. Therefore, spiritually and intellectually, it was easy for the sinner, for the sinner's soul, to convert to Christianity. For there he would find forgiveness, eternal life, and a purpose for his existence. The superiority of Christianity over Judaism, so this presentation would go, was self-evident. I do not exaggerate when I confess that this is what I was taught at the church that I attended as a young Christian, and in fact, what thousands of Christians have been taught. The situation is very complex. However, I suggest that one of the reasons why Judaism, here concretized in the conversion of Saul, is so demonized is because it is foreign to us. That is to say, what Judaism is tends to be foreign to us. When we speak about the conversion of Saul, as I just did, it is easier to map our own conversion stories onto Paul's and thereby find further comfort by concluding that the pattern of our own conversions is a biblical one. Familiarity brings comfort and peace. There's another possible, and here I underline the word possible, reason why we misrepresent Saul's conversion, indeed Paul's theology, and it has to do with the way we read Paul, particularly Romans. The majority of Christians have, have found in Romans a pattern that goes from the negative to the positive. In order to capture this pattern, Theologians have used the phrase, plight to solution. We read in Romans, according to this pattern, that, that all are sinners, whether Gentile or Jew. The Gentiles do not have the law, but God has nevertheless revealed himself to them. And instead of responding with thanksgiving, they built idols. There follows a catalog of vices that many Jews in antiquity used to describe the depravity of the Gentiles. So what you find in Romans 1.18 through chapter 2, I believe, or at the end of chapter 1, uh, you find similar things in other uh, works by Jewish authors to highlight the depravity of Gentiles. However, Jews according to Paul, are no better. Despite being the chosen people of God and receiving the very oracles of God, the Jews failed to obey God. And so whether Jew or Gentile, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and, for, and fall short of the glory of God. Humanity is indeed in a plight. But then there is the turn to the solution. God, based on his sheer love, has sent his son, Jesus Christ, who has atoned for our sins. When we come to him in repentance and faith, all our sins are blotted out. Romans 8, 1, one of my favorite texts of all scripture, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This admittedly simplified presentation constitutes wonderful news for those who are desperate and are looking for forgiveness in a new life. It stands to reason that if this was the gospel that Paul preached, the same gospel is the one he believed when converting from Judaism to Christianity. 
from Judaism to Christianity. So again, let me repeat that. It stands, to, it stands to reason that if this was the gospel that Paul preached, if this is what he believed, this uh, apply to solution, then this same gospel is the one he believed when converting from Judaism to Christianity. There is much more that could be said about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity as concretized in the, in the conversion of Saul. But not, now I wish to problematize why Saul converted to Christianity and thereby generalized the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, a relation which is central for our understanding of the Bible. So uh, basically, I want to, um, in the context of my class in New Testament theology, I want to shake my students a little bit. Um, maybe that's not the best analogy. But uh, yeah whisper some things into their ears uh, about Judaism uh, and uh, try to, uh, yeah, try to make the, the picture that they bring in a little more hazy uh, in order to force them to read more texts and read them more carefully. So um, I put it to them this way. Why would Paul become a Christian when, as a Jew, he had it all? And the, the, the looks that I get are, are pus, puzzle looks. What do you mean that he had it all? So, well, think about it. As a Jew, Paul was part of the elect people of God. The God of the universe had chosen this little people. Uh, not because of their greatness or because they were more pious than other nations, but out of sheer grace, he had chosen this little people and he would reveal himself to them and he would be their God forever, no matter what. And Saul belonged to those people. Number one. Number two, because they were the people of God, God revealed himself to them. He gave them the Torah. And uh, you do any reading in rabbinic Judaism, and you're going to see how important the Torah is for the Jews. Um, it was everything. Um, you know, if you had the Torah, uh, that, that just showed uh, your superiority. Um, so you, God has chosen you in election, in gracious election. God has given you the Torah. God has promised you a beautiful land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, God has given you precepts to guide your life, uh, existence without any um, rails can quickly become boring uh, and even suicidal, I would say. Uh, but when you have laws and rules, uh, some of those things are helpful in, in uh, forming a pattern for life. So, so they had the, the Old Testament, the Bible. Um, and the question then becomes, oh, well, what about sin? Uh, the, the true uh, anthropological reality that no one can evade is part of who we are. What about sin? Well, God has, some, has done something about that too. He has given you the temple. And with that temple, um, your sins can be taken care of. That's kind of a simple way of presenting it. But if you think about it, that's not bad. <laughs> you have the God of the universe as your God. He has given you his Torah. He has revealed himself to you, uh, given you a land, given you a way to deal with your sin. Um, if you do sin, and you are exiled, uh, if you repent and cry out to him with all your heart, he will bring you back. Um, and then one day, depending what areas of Judaism you read, uh, a Messiah would come. Uh, and, and as a friend, as a Jewish friend of mine um, used to say, that, that, that meant for us that uh, 
every Jew, every Jew would have a home in the suburbs uh, with two garage, uh, house, and a dog. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> that was that was the, her interpretation of uh, the blessings of Judaism. Anyways, um, if you have it all like that, why would you convert to Christianity? And so when you put the question like that, uh, it makes you think a little bit more about precisely wh why Paul uh, became a Christian. Okay, so uh, to dig a little deeper into these uh, categories, uh, the, the uh, method that I want to use is the following. I want to look at some biblical texts that talk about those advantages, those blessings of being a Jew, and then I want to use some texts from the Second Temple period that uh, match with what the biblical texts say. So, in your handout, um, be, uh, here with Roman numeral two, I began uh, to to pose uh, to pose the questions by showing uh, the blessings of Judaism. So, uh, this is coming from Romans one and two. What advantage is there in being a Jew? You would think that if, uh, even though the Jews had the law, while the Gentiles didn't have the law, and yet the Jews sinned, you would think, well, what advantage is there is there for having the law if we're going to break it anyways? Well, what advantage is there? Paul's answer is much in every way. Uh, and I would think that uh, that's, a, that's just a biblical answer. That's a straight up biblical answer. God has said that if I, <laughs> by giving you the law, uh, I've, I've done good. I've blessed you. And so it is good. It is, an, <laughs> it is an advantage. It's just a biblical statement. So anyways, what advantage is there in being a Jew? Much in every way. And uh, that question is going to get picked up again uh, in, a, in, in a different sort of way, in chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. Some of the easiest chapters, right, of the New Testament. So if we look at chapter 9, verses 4 through 5, um, Paul here gives us a list of what advantage is there in being a Jew? What are the blessings? So number one in your handout, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted, uh, excuse me, uh, we're still in three. Uh, we'll move to nine in just a second. Uh, so first, Romans 3, 2, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very word of God. Um, it's interesting the language that Paul uses here to speak that uh, which Israel has received, or that which ha that which has been entrusted to Israel, the logia of God. Um, when you look at Philo, for example, uh, philosopher slash exegete uh, from Alexandria, uh, and when you look at the uh, Epistle of Aristias, uh, the the concept of the logia of God is one of um, almost, I don't want to use the, uh, we use the word secretive, um, but, but the logia of God is um, something that is, uh, that comes from the depths of the being of, of God uh, to the people. Uh, it, it's almost mantic although I hesitate to use that word. But uh, um, you think about the Greeks and the oracle at Delphi, uh, when you went and you paid <laughs> for a prophecy, uh, and um, the uh, python would, uh, yeah, God would overcome her, and, and she would... Uh, give you the very words of God. Uh, oracles, I think, is an excellent translation of, 
of that word. Uh, and so the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Uh, notice the, the language of entrusted. Um, these are not their words. This is not, this is not uh, their revelation. This is coming from God. And they're entrusted with it. Um, and Philo uses it to speak of Balaam, uh, who sort of gets overcome by God uh, in Numbers 24, 16. And he just speaks. It's almost like the human, uh, like human rationality is moved out of the way. And all you have is the total direct access to, uh, to the mind of God, logia, oracles. Uh, it's also use of the Torah. Um, and then in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, 4, and I think Doug will remember that, would remember this too, uh, we hear about being entrusted with the gospel. Pistetuna, uh, forget if it's a deity for a, for, or a preposition, but entrusted with the gospel. So God has spoken to you uh, from the very depths of his heart, giving you his gospel. Um, you've been entrusted with the oracles of God. Okay, now we can move to number two, uh, nine four. So, what is the next uh, blessing? Um, nine four, we hear of. Uh, Theirs is the people of Israel, or simply uh, the, people, the people of Israel. Um, why choose the term Israel here? One of the things uh, I tell my students about exegesis is that um, a key for exegesis is always asking, why is this term used instead of this other term? You might be expecting one word, but a different word is given you. Why, 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 why is that the case? Dig in deeper into that, and that will help your exegesis. Uh, so why use the, the people of Israel here? The term is often used when Jews are speaking of themselves as the people of God. So when they're speaking with each other, or when they're speaking to outsiders, they use the terminology of Israel, Israelites. Therefore, by speaking of the people of Israel, it is likely that the covenant of election is being highlighted here by Paul. Uh, one nice text, which I would invite you to turn to, is Exodus 4.22. Uh, so Exodus 4.22 Verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Uh, do you see the uh, closeness, the familial use of language here. Israel is my son. Uh, so let him go. Let Israel go. So by using the, the language, going back to, to Romans 9, 4, the people of Israel, he's highlighting, I think, already the covenant of election. So going back to the language that I use in a little bit more, uh, more of a colloquial sense at the beginning of the lecture, uh, you know, huh, what, what, what blessings do the Jews have? Well, they have it all. Well, th number one, they are the elect people of God. So much so that, that they can be called Israel, the son of God. Next, in Romans uh, 9, uh, we hear that uh, theirs is the adoption to sonship. There you see the connection. Um, to the previous blessing. 
Paul is highlighting God's grace by speaking of the adoption of Israel. This is an act of grace which shows God's love, but which is not recipro reciproc reciprocated by the people. That is the way that it is often used. I have adopted you. I have taken you to be my son or daughter, and yet you have not responded in the way that I that you should respond. Um, one key text here would be Hosea 11.1. 1. Um, when Israel was a child, I loved them, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burn incense to images. But when Israel was a child, I loved them. So there is that adoption to sonship. Uh, God was not under any obligation to adopt Israel, to adopt this people, this little people, and yet he did. Next, returning to Romans 9, Paul continues. There's, uh, we have to imagine the word is here, but there's is the divine glory. Um, I like the way Cranfield, uh, an older but still really good commentator on the book of Romans, um, he speaks about the divine glory as the outward sign of God's presence with his people. The outward sign of God's presence with his people. So when you think of God's glory, you think of uh, majesty, fire, light. Um, don't come any closer. <laughs> uh, just the glory of the Lord passing uh, by Moses uh, is an outward sign of, uh, of God's presence with his people. Uh, to be uh, part of the people of God is to, as it were, to live in the midst of glory. Um, we continue. He says um, that to the Israelites belong the covenants. The covenants. That's very interesting. Uh, I wonder why, why uh, Paul put this uh, later and not at the beginning. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Since this is a small class, I didn't think about doing this, but now, now maybe, maybe I'll ask. Since it appears that everything begins with the covenant, why not begin with the covenant here in chapter 9? Chris, you had, yeah. Ah, ah. Uh, yes. So like, like a chiastic, chiastic uh, construction and that, that comes in the middle. I'd have to look at that more. I hadn't thought about it that way. I've thought about the uh, how it's patterned, but not uh, not in that particular way. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I'll carry on then. Uh, the covenants. Uh, yeah, uh, Michael Volter in, in his comment, in the second volume of his commentary, really really good commentary. Uh, uh, in his opinion, the, referen the reference is to all the covenants God has made with Israel, from uh, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15 to the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. So um, by using the, the plural here, uh, is, this is not done by accident, but is on purpose. Um, Paul wants to remind 
uh, the readers that uh, they are the recipients, the blessed recipients of all the covenants where God has uh, said, I will be your God, you will be my people. I'm going to be for you. Um, Karl Barth uh, in, um, in the Church of Maddox basically says that all the covenants can be boiled down to the idea of Emmanuel, God with us, God be, being with us. So that's another, uh, in some ways, the uh, blessing election. Um, election being the, uh, um, the gospel itself. Again, to go back to Bart, uh, the best of news. Uh, we should think of election. If we think of election uh, as, as covenant, we shouldn't think of election as light and darkness, as many people do. But we should think of election as pure light. There may be some things that we don't understand about election, but, but election is the best of all news. Um, God has, in Christ, elected us to be his people. Okay, number seven, uh, the temple worship. The temple worship. So, um, we can read all about that in the book of Leviticus, and, and uh, a lot of the temple worship is keeping the land pure. Right, God has given the, given them this land, and it's not only their being pure, but it's keeping the land pure so that so that He will not uh, vomit them out of the land. Uh, one of the questions that I wrestle with with this uh, blessing, the temple worship, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the reality of sin, is the is the whole uh, question of uh, high-handed sins. Uh, and I have asked, I've gone around and asked some of my colleagues uh, who are, you know, Doug talked about colleagues with uh, Greek New Testaments. I had to go to colleagues with Hebrew Old Testament, <laughs> uh, Ross and, and many others. Uh, is, is there a sin for which there is no atonement, uh, high-handed sin? And Alan's answer to that is uh, no. You, there, is, there is no atonement for, for high-handed sins. So the only way that you can be forgiven is by throwing yourself on the mercy of God. Um, of course, it's based on the atonement, um, but God, you have to go to God in humility. Um, and he used the example of Psalm 51. After all that David had done, he said, I would offer you a sacrifice if I could, but but there's nothing I can do, so uh, be merciful to me. Um, whereas others of my colleagues believe that in Yom Kippur, um, even the high-handed sins uh, could be forgiven. That would be something to, to study a little bit in more depth and to, um, to come back to later. But in principle here, we find that with the tabernacle first and then with the temple, um, they could meet God, uh, heaven on earth, uh, yeah, heaven on earth, God coming down to the land and meeting his people, worshiping God, um, and indeed God forgiving their sins. High handed too? Well, that's for another day. The next is uh, the next blessing is the promises, um, and in light of uh, Romans four thirteen to twenty two and Galatians three, uh, I believe that this is a reference to the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. So, um, this is in, in in some ways the covenant. Number nine, the fathers. Um, 
which is interesting when you read Matthew's genealogy, there are mothers too, right? Uh, here with Paul, we have the fathers. Not because he's against women or anything like that, but, but it's interesting to compare those two. Uh, but, but he talks about the fathers. Uh, and I think the idea here is similar to Hebrews 11. Um, and also similar to uh, a book that is, not, uh, that is not accepted as canonical in Protestantism. I'm not sure if it's accepted as canonical in Roman Catholicism. Does anyone know? Is there a... Yeah, Ben, sir. For, for Roman Catholics? Okay, good. Uh, in in, in Serac 44 to 50, you have a long list, uh, really an encomium of the great men of Israel. It's a fascinating section, really, uh, where um, there is a we speak about election. <laughs> There's a kind of election here only showing you the best of Israel. Uh, I think the author of Wisdom of Solomon does something, something similar too in his book. But uh, it shows you in 44 to 50, it gives you a list, an encomium of the great men of Israel. Um, and I think the goal is to show uh, how far back Israel goes. So unlike today where the latest is better. So the latest iPhone is the best. In antiquity, the older was better, right? And so uh, in 44 to 50, I think that the author there is, is showing how far the people of God go, the Israelites go, and, uh, and how righteous they are. That is one of the emphases there. Uh, and it's true, there were some great men in the lineage of the people of Israel. And Paul is saying, yes, uh, we have a great people. We go back. We're not new. Uh, and then in number 10, we have the human ancestry of the Messiah, which there you can link it to nine, the fathers, and then the, the human ancestry of the Messiah. Paul will speak more of the Messiah in the rest of 9 to 11, uh, as the savior, the savior of all humanity. Conclusion. As a Jew, Paul or Saul had it all. He did not even have pangs of conscience. As we read Galatians 1 through 2 and Philippians 3, 4 through 6 and the Acts of the Apostles, Paul did not seem to be looking for a Messiah to forgive his sins. For that, he had the temple. Whenever he speaks of his pre-Christian life as sinful, see, for example, 1 Timothy 1, it is from uh, his perspective as a Christian. Prior to Christ, Paul saw himself as a righteous Jew, full of zeal for the law, and a persecutor of the church which he likely viewed as uh, the church, which he likely viewed as a false, uh, as, as propagating false doctrine, a, conta a contagion, contagion that would bring punishment to Israel. So I, I think that uh, Paul probably viewed himself as uh, Phineas in the Old Testament, who uh, to avoid God's judgment on the people, uh, he, well, he kills some of the people. Uh, and so, so Paul, with his zeal, uh, that did not give him a, uh, a dirty conscience when he went to bed, but that actually uh, showed how godly he was. Great zeal for the Lord. Okay, let's move now to Paul's conversion, or Saul's conversion. Uh, in light of of all these blessings that he had as a Jew, why in the, why in the world would Saul become a Christian? Um, let's begin with the letters. Um, there are a few statements there that talk about um, his conversion. Uh, Galatians 1, 
13 to 16. Um, it might be good to, to see that, that passage together. Yeah. Um, he is responding um, to um, the false teachings and the, uh, yeah, some of the false statements that the uh, Judaizers have been dropping into the churches of Galatia. And one of the ways that he's going to respond is by talking about uh, his conduct prior to becoming a Christian. And verse 13 uh, begins, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. I think when, when we read Judaism, we have to think of particularly uh, the Jewish religion. Uh, the emphasis is on spirituality, religion. Uh, you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. Uh, well, how was it, Paul? It was intense. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. By this, I'm paraphrasing here, here, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So I was so zealous that I was willing to persecute uh, this people. Verse 15, But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. Verse 17, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. So just a few words there about his, about his conversion. Um, and I don't know if conversion is even the right word. We'll come back to that later. But uh, he, he, he looks at it from the perspective of God, in a sense. Um, when it pleased God, uh, he revealed his son in me. Um, he also uses uh, language of the prophets, prophetic language. Uh, God who set me apart from my mother's womb. You find that kind of language in both Isaiah and Jeremiah. Of the prophet being set aside by God uh, to, to preach the word that God would give him. Uh, another text where we find... Uh, Some expressions of Paul's uh, conversion is in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointed me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. So now he views himself that way. <laughs> Back then, he viewed himself as full of zeal. Now it's sinful zeal. And yet he was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. You can help uh, pay, pay for Philip's school by, by my commentary on First Timothy, and there, there, there you'll get some of my answers about what that means. Uh, but... Uh, in one fourteen, he continues, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. What a contrast uh, from uh, the past to the present. Now that he's a believer, everything looks different. Or to put it in a different way, he sees the truth. He sees reality. But for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, 
the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense uh, patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And then all of that leads to an explosion of worship and so on. Um, then we have statements of Paul's conversion uh, from the book of Acts. And it is a very important topic for Luke because he has, it, he has three descriptions of it in, the, in, in his book. Um, Cornelius has two. That's important. But Saul has three. Uh, and, and there is a pattern in those conversions uh, and the language that is used that is very similar to what you find in, in, Galatia, in Galatians and, and, and First Timothy. Uh, so there's the idea of, uh, well, let's, let's, let's look at the text, particularly uh, Acts chapter 9. Uh, I was uh, reading a commentary that who, uh, a commentator who complained that uh, the way that the conversion of Saul is narrated here uh, is from a Christian perspective, and what a shame is that because it distorts the historical reality. Well, what can you do? Uh, but, but that is true. It, it, is, uh, it is being described from the perspective of someone who knows who Jesus Christ is. So we have until, what, 415? Okay, so I better start wrapping it up here. Uh, so Saul, uh, still breathing out murder, murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest. He gets letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Um, and, and he's full of seal, continuing uh, his work for the Lord as he would have seen it. Uh, and as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light uh, from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will uh, be told what you must do. We are told that... Uh, He's uh, fasting uh, later in, in the chapter, and that tells me that he realized that what, what he was doing was wrong. And he was fasting, begging, humiliating, humbling himself before God, asking for his forgiveness. Um, and so we have a very similar account in chapter 22. He's saying this to a crowd in Jerusalem, uh, they, they go crazy. Um, and if you've ever been in a, in a place with an open place with a big mob, uh, you know how easy that can turn into dangerous and life-threatening. And that's what happened to Paul as he was retelling his story probably in Aramaic, he says. Um, and, and and they could they couldn't take another word and they he he had to be rescued actually by a Roman soldier and then uh, in Acts 26 uh, he spe he speaks before Agrippa uh, who knew very much about Judaism and was for the Jews when when the Jews were behaving in, in his opinion uh, in the right way and then uh, Verse 15, then I asked, uh, well, verse 14, we all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. That's a statement that you find in Euripides, uh, the Bacchae, uh, and it is used of uh, a king, uh, Penteus, who is resisting the worshipers of Dionysius. Um, they are the, sort of the new cult, um, 
and, and they do wild things, especially in the evening. Uh, and, and Pentheus wants to stop, uh, and he's told, uh, "Why are you, why are you kicking against the goats? Um, you're not you're not going to defeat the god Dionysius." And in fact, he doesn't. He gets destroyed at the end. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. That's what Paul was doing. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, Isaiah, and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So, uh, very similar to Galatians, uh, where he's rescued by God so that he can go preach, uh, proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And so, I think that uh, Roman numeral three, a letter, excuse me, that should be letter C, uh, A, B, and C. Yeah, uh, Paul is presented here as a theomachos, a God fighter. Uh, someone who didn't realize what he was doing, but he was actually fighting the real God. Okay, conclusion. Uh, is conversion the right concept to think about what happened to Saul? Why in the world would Paul become a Christian? Paul is the conquered Theomachos, who is overwhelmed by the powerful experience of the risen Lord Jesus, and subsequently rethinks the scriptures and the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And, uh, and everything is turned upside down. So um, here are a couple of things that I want to say. Um, the conversion of Saul doesn't strike me as being something rational. Uh, but rather more of an encounter an encounter with the risen, powerful Lord. Um, should we then think about conversion in the same way today? Um, many churches, when the gospel is preached uh, and when they ask for a conversion, they want to make sure that you have, that, that you say just the right words when when you come to meet the Lord. It's almost like magical words. Um, you know, and again, I go back to my own church, real blessing in my life, but, uh, but I think they were captive to that, that if you don't say just the right words and do the, just do the right things, um, you have to maybe rethink whether you have become a believer or not. Whereas with Saul, it's uh, surely he, he's thinking, he's rational. Who are you, Lord? So he's, he's talking, he's, he's thinking, but it's almost like he's overpowered by the Lord. And uh, he's so overpowered that uh, he can barely speak. Um, so should we think of that as a conversion? Uh, should we think of that as a call? Um, that's something that that I have to think more about, and that maybe we have to think more about uh, when thinking about Saul's conversion. Uh, but, but, but what I want to leave you with is, 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 with, the idea, is with the idea that uh, Paul's conversion from Judaism to Christianity uh, is, is, is an experience, it's a, it's a religious encounter, um, it's an encounter with God, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and it's not how correct your thinking is about God. Now, I want, don't get me wrong here, I don't want to say that what you think about God doesn't matter, that would be ridiculous, you know, I wouldn't be teaching here at Beaton. <laughs> uh, of course, 
you have to believe. That's why sound doctrine is preached. But, but the emphasis is not so much on getting everything correct. Uh, the emphasis is more on the power of God and uh, submission and uh, conversion and surrender to him. Uh, I am an Anglican, and uh, I, am, I am an Anglican with, with one exception. <laughs> I still haven't come around with a, uh, inf infant baptism. Uh, maybe I will come around one day, but uh, my wife likes to say that's the the Baptist in your wife. Um, um, you know, my dad has been a Baptist pastor for decades, and so uh, you marry me. You know, you, you st we still have that. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, when 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 our son Philip was uh, about nine years old, uh, I I talked to him about about baptism. Um, and ask him questions, very important question. Who is God? What is faith? Uh, so what theologians speak about, uh, fides quae, uh, the objective aspect of our faith. That has to be there, okay? Um, but I caught myself uh, in, in trying to make sure that he knew perfectly, exactly what to think, uh, and only then could he get baptized. And I remember talking to a family member and saying, don't you think that Philip is too young to get baptized? Does, does he get everything? Does he understand everything? And then I sort of, you know, uh, my eyes were open. <laughs> and I said, well, do, do you understand everything about the Christian faith? So, uh, yes, fides quae, the objective aspect of the faith is crucial, is important, but uh, the emphasis on soul's conversion is an overpowering by a merciful God uh, that leaves him in silence. The only thing he can ask is, who are you, Lord? Okay. Um, I went longer than I wanted to go, uh, but that's that's it. Thank you very much, Pastor Julia. We've got a few minutes for discussion, uh, and I don't mean to dominate this. I just want to make sure that people can hear well, and everybody gets to have a conversation who wants to be in on the conversation. I don't see any. Oh, I do see a hand up. Yes, so I'll uh, we'll go to Laura first. Please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I definitely see that as, as the, the servant. So, you know, I think you have the servant with a capital S and then the servant with a, the servants with a lower cap, lower S. Uh, and, and Paul is part of that uh, with a lowercase s. Do you think that maybe that it, it might help people who are sensible not to be in obedience with their life? So to be an obedient Israelite um, would be to be part of the servant. Is that is that kind of what what you're getting at? Yeah, just in, in light of the scripture with the Messiah and like all stuff and servants and all all of that, um, then what does it mean to to be called to be a righteous servant and not then what does it mean? Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, I, I, I want to say yes to that. Um, but I want to say that maybe um, that's something that he could think carefully about after his conversion. You know, One of the things that I am trying to put the brakes on is the idea that somehow all of Paul's theology was downloaded. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make a, car make a caricature of others, but... Uh, I want to get away from the idea that everything was downloaded. 
I think was, it was a long process uh, of working uh, through those passages uh, of the Old Testament. But I think that the key was, well, sounds simple. Well, Catherine Tanner wrote a book, Christ the Key. So maybe it's not so simple. <laughs> but the, 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 the key is Christ. You know, Christ is the Lord, um, clothed in glory. Um, I, I remember, I think I spoke to Jonathan about this, um, that Paul ha has written, so I think it's in 2 Corinthians, that uh, Satan himself uh, can dress like an angel of light. So how did Paul know that this was not a satanic uh, impersonator, <laughs> that this really was the Lord? And, and my answer, as far as I can come up with one, is that uh, that that was a, that was faith. You know, he he cannot prove it, you know. and I think the uh, I think the, there's an aspect of the there's an we cannot think our way into conversion, and I'm a little bit concerned with that kind of apologetics that I see around that. Uh, um, you know, apologetics is, is the bridge that can get you all the way there. It can only, you know, can only get you so far. Uh, and I don't, and I don't even know that that's the language that I would use. But I want to be respectful of what others think. Yeah. Going off of that, um, I'm interested in what you think. So in Romans 10. Um, starting in verse 2, I'll, I'll just read it. Paul says, For I bear witness that they, and I think he's talking about the Jews, have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, um, and specifically in ignorance of the righteousness of God. So I'm curious um, what you think about uh, Paul's understanding of, uh, of knowledge. In some way he's seen his, his conversion as a transformation of knowledge, um, uh -huh. A bright understanding, but as you're saying, not strictly or primarily in, in a rational sort of way. Hmm. So, in what what other senses do you think Paul understands knowledge? I don't have my my Greek New Testament, so I don't know for sure. Yeah. And specifically in, in the context of coming to a right understanding of the righteousness of God, which I know is... Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it would be reductionist to, to just say he had a religious encounter and that I think he's part of a community, right? And that community has an understanding of the righteousness of God. Uh, I want to say that, that Paul maybe reach an understanding that was very particular, uh, very strong. Um, but I want to say that uh, to the extent that he thought rationally uh, about his conversion and how the, how the Bible fits together and how red salvation history fits together, I think part of that is a... Um, a community knowledge that where, where that knowledge and that understanding is in community where the Holy Spirit is present guiding uh, the community to uh, a right understanding of Scripture but but you know uh, I almost <laughs> I laugh at it because it, it's I don't know if it's an answer but uh, A.P. Sanders, when, when he was asked uh, uh, why, what was the problem with Judaism, uh, I think he said, uh, it's not Christianity. Is that, is that, isn't that what he said? Yeah. That's what he says Paul's answer is, invalid Paul is Judaism. Yeah. He's in print on that. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's towards the end of the book. What's the problem with, with Judaism? It's that it's not Christianity. And that's... A, a sort of an exaggerated way of saying things. Um, 
Stephen Westerholm says that you know he's from Texas, so you, you should expect that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's like uh, the experience with Jesus was so powerful uh, that uh, everything else now looks different. Christ is the center of everything, and 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 that's uh, and that should have an effect on on how we do hermeneutics. So a, a lot of you know, since I do some work on Acts, I have a lot of people ask me, um, you know, you know how the apostles preach and they preach Christ, but they use certain texts and so on that don't seem to point to Christ. Uh, can you do that, or was that only for the apostles? Uh, and my answer is, well, if I understand the genre of Acts properly, um, I think one of the things that Luke was doing was showing the Christians how the early church interacted with the synagogue on questions of the identity of the Messiah so that they would learn how to do it. So should we follow the examples of, uh, that we, that we find in the book of Acts. Uh, absolutely, that's why he wrote his book, so that we will know how the heroes of the church, of the first generation, how they uh, engage the synagogue to show that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, I, yeah, I don't think we should be afraid of. Can you be too Christological? No? Uh, we got time for one more question. Take it short notice, students. Uh, I really appreciate this. This is a good conversation. I'm interested in, as you know. And I think one thing that happens sometimes is this question gets posed, and people aren't clear if they're asking a sociological question or if they're asking a soteriological question. And so you get these critiques. No, Paul didn't change religion. There was no such thing as Judaism before the Slavic was born. Right. There was no such thing yet as Christianity. He went from being a Pharisee to being a messianic Jew. And that just kind of takes place over here. And I think one of the things that was nice is you posed this question much more in terms of um, was Paul called not from Judaism to Christianity, but in some sense from death to life mm -hmm. in a way that he didn't even realize he was in the state of death. And that, that diagnosis was kind of retrospective. And it just struck me that uh, some of the passages you point to in Galatians really emphasize that divine activity places on the apostle not from human means but through Jesus mm -hmm. Christ and God who gives us peace. That the gospel I preached was not given to me, it was not taught to me from a human source, but through a revelation, like an apocalypse mm -hmm. of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. And then in the narrative you had, he says, I was I had a former life, I was zealous, I was advancing among many of my peers, I was persecuting the church, but when God in verse 15, the subject of the verbs changed from being Paul to being God. Mm, he was mm. pleased to reveal his son to me. Mm. So it's only retrospectively that That's... Paul sees there's no preparation for this. Mm. Uh, what lied within him since the medieval school knew was that he was doing what he thought was 100% right, and in retrospect came to see this being 100% wrong. Yeah. Persecuting the church, I don't mean everything about his life. Right, right. So just that emphasis on divine activity. So I, I suppose part of the question is, when you're asking this, why would he become a Christian? Are you asking it in terms of uh, change of religion, sociology? Or are you thinking much more fundamentally about sort of the questions of life, death, forgiveness, salvation? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Can you think? Uh, can you think without a sociological uh, without you know, can you think without without sociology? So so, so that, that I think that's a, that's kind of a question that I that I want to. Uh, what you say was very helpful, by the way, but but we belong to a culture, whatever language you want to use about a society. Um, can we think without one? Um, or do, to be a human being, do you need to to be part of of um, you know, of a, of a particular community or society. Um, yeah, ultimately, I'm asking, 
existential questions. Um, that, that's really what I'm what I'm after. Um, and asking those questions for the church, um, and trying to help, in this case, students in particular, uh, and I'm learning a bunch in the, in the process of um, trying to problematize things when they think about Judaism. Um, when, when you pro problematize things, at the same time, I think you clarify things because the questions that you thought were basic are actually not that basic. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I'd have to think more about your question, but uh, I want to go in the direction that, that, that you are, suggest you are suggesting. Uh, it's more than just a change of uh, sex or a change of religion. It's a change of fundamentally to the very bottom who we are. Uh, but can you do that? Uh, Ah, societal. <laughs> Let's use the alpha privative here. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to see, to think, you know, to hear what you think about that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. No. You join me in thanking Dr. Padilla. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your patience.